Bishop. Welcome into Hardcore Penn State football. Blue and white weekend has come and gone. How many answers did we get coming out of the weekend? Penn State gets a new commit. Talk about that. And the transfer portal is open again, which is our favorite topic to discuss on the show. A lot to get into in this week's episode of Hardcore Penn State Football. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you're listening. And thanks for being here with us. Welcome into Hardcore Penn State Football. I'm Corey Listoki. With me, as always, the great Sean Payne. How are you doing today, Sean? Not too bad. You had a little bit of a WWE there. Mm. So I really like that. I'm excited. I'm, I am I will say this. like We're very transparent on the show about how we feel about pretty much anything, including ourselves. Uh, maybe it's just the weather. Maybe it was the blue and white being back around Penn State football, talking Penn State football a little bit more. Um, I feel a little, little bit more revitalized, a little bit more energy, a little bit more juice about me than maybe – maybe the previous couple weeks. So um, I'm really excited to get into the show. Really excited to talk Penn State football today, Sean. I could tell by the introduction. Um, you like that? You're a little bit more oomph to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, you're not letting the windy day at... No, uh, God, Happy it was windy. Valley. God, that was maybe the windiest I've ever been there for a game. So Definitely spring game, but God, I was just... It was unbelievable how windy it was. A lot, so a lot of people I know that are diehard tailgaters that live in the area packed it up and went back to their place to tailgate, including myself. Now, Sean and I were part of the beginning festivities uh, with Happy Valley United and Mercury. Um, had a fantastic time there. A uh, lot of former alums there. Jason Cabinda was speaking there. Brandon Bell was speaking there. Uh, Trace McSorley, we got to talk to Trace for a little bit. Sean Clifford was there. Um, obviously, Brandon Bell, Christian Hackenberg, and Aeneas Hawkins are, were there as well. Uh, Miles Dredd, part of State Media, was there. Uh, that was great. But right afterwards, it was windy. I went home, watched the game from home. Sean, you went in the stadium. You braved the elements. How was the experience being inside Beaver Stadium? You know, I do love the blue white game because it's kind of a, it has its own atmosphere. It's almost like carnivalistic because you have the music playing the whole time. There's always a lot of stuff going on around the the plays. Uh, you'll have Franklin, you know, just dabbing people up like right before a play happens. And it, it's just, it's just funny to see uh, just how relaxed and everything it is. And it's, it's the one thing at Penn State outside of the free autograph session prior to the game that hasn't really changed over the years because it's pretty much the same exact way as it's as it's always been. So um, that's it's always a cool day, I think. Um, but God, you know, when when you're in the stadium, too, I, I've always felt this way with Beaver Stadium. I always feel the elements more, especially wind, um, because right. it just comes in through the sides or over the top in the north end zone and you just constantly feel it and it wasn't even that cold uh but it right. makes it, it because it was probably like low 50s but it makes it feel like you're in the you're in the low 40s with the, with with the wind chill um but yeah you, you it's like always the uh time. you like the music being played like that i mean i'm not saying let's do that for the normal games even if it was allowed but I personally find it very annoying, but the music's playing the whole time. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I mean, it, it's not something that I prefer. I, I'm kind of with you there. Um, but it's supposed to be a more loose atmosphere, I suppose. Um, more family-friendly. Um, but I could do without it as well. Yeah, and before we get too far in the show, we do have two shout-outs that I want to want to give. Sean and I very much know our place in the world of Penn State media. Um, we are the best. We know that. But besides that, we also know that not everybody's going to recognize us when we walk the streets every day. I think maybe almost everybody does recognize us, but they re they respect our privacy, Sean. 
so they don't even bother. Obviously. Um, but we we understand that not everyone's going to recognize us and or ask for a picture with us, et cetera. Um, was a little bit slighted that during the Mercury stuff, they were handing out Sharpies to like the former players so they could get ready for autographs, and Sean and I weren't even offered a Sharpie. Uh, but that's that's okay. Um, I feel like that's like the uh, the office gif there. You write take notes there. Um, but I did want to give a shout out to Judd, who was at the Happy Valley United event with his helmet getting autographs and uh, recognized us, came up to us, said he listens to the show, loves the show, you know, keep keep up the good work, etc. That to me was my favorite part of of the morning. Um, I don't think look. We're not making a bunch of money, even after signing with Mercury. You can ask them to pay us more. That'd be sweet. Um, but those moments, as cool it is that you know to talk with Hackenberg and talk to Trace and all those different things, the coolest thing by far is um, people like that Judd coming up to us and just having a conversation with us. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's pretty fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how we got into it, right? Like, we didn't get into this to get signed to any kind of deal. And we were fortunate enough, because of you guys, people who listen, to, uh, to, to you know, sign on. And we have met some, you know, cool people, uh, former Great players. interviews. Yeah, great, great interviews. Uh, great, you know, we've had journalists on here. We've had former players. And we're always appreciative of that. But, God, when it was just me and Corey. Uh, for most of it yeah we were our community was you guys and people like judd who was like Corey said gracious enough to come up to us uh we had a little conversation so yeah that was um it 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 always like well part of why we do this is just to talk about penn state football and Corey and i would be doing it anyway so uh being able to share conversations with you guys that's that's um pretty cool really really awesome so yeah. thank you and if you do see us yeah walk up to us and say hi um i don't usually bite um and that's usually. the same thing too that's why i do you can even know, debate us yeah you can try um <laughs> i know a lot of our following is audio only but i do recommend hobby on youtube because i do enjoy getting the youtube comments and fleshing it out with you uh, especially if you have a really poor opinion on something. So um, I do recommend hopping on YouTube but for a live show every once in a while um, so we can interact a little bit more. We probably should do more Twitter spaces and things like that as well. Um, I, I, the second shout out is to Tyler on Instagram. He's asked us a couple questions before. Uh, fan questions, that is. He happened to be walking into the stadium as I was walking out. He was on the phone. He's wearing a Pittsburgh Pirates hat. But he just randomly yells, hardcore Penn State football. And I'm, like, looking around, and and there he is. He has his hand up and just kind of gives me a head nod. Um, that was, again, same kind of thing. Pretty awesome, pretty sweet. I was like, I didn't even know who, where that was coming from. So shout out to Tyler as well. Um, again, that, that's pretty cool. The, uh, the, final, the final, I guess, shout out. We did have an awesome five-star review on apple Podcasts. we we still like the five-star reviews i don't plug them nearly as much um but if you if you do drop us a five-star review on apple we'll read on the show um still think we can send you a sticker as well um or maybe mercury has a better idea of what we should do instead of just a sticker um i'm not gonna read the one i posted it on twitter um it's really long but it was it's probably one of the best reviews we've ever gotten. I think we actually got it in like January. I just kind of forgot to chat. I didn't check those as often as I probably should. Um, but thank you for that. It was a it was an excellent one. So little little plug there to to go write us a five star review. And again, I guess if it's really good, we'll share it on social media. And then as long as it's not too long, we'll probably read it on the show. So um, those are a couple housekeeping things. One last housekeeping thing: is we won't have a show next week. Um, got some things going on. Um, but, um, uh, also, so probably not this episode, but the next episode, 
do want to do some film breakdown, Sean. Wasn't able to quite get to where I wanted to from a film perspective from the blue and white game. Um, so we'll uh, we'll table that for for probably two weeks. But that gives us something to talk about as we or as we get into May. So, um, all right. Before we get to the blue be and white, May. yeah. Before we get into the blue and white breakdown, Penn State got a new commit. And that commit is four-star running back Alvin A. Train Henderson, uh, running back from Elba, Alabama, which I'm going to speak to in a second. But Sean, thoughts on Mr. Henderson? Yeah, the freakishly good high school football player. Uh, tore up the state of Alabama. He does, um, you know, he does play at a lower level i think he's single a down in alabama but still he was averaging some eye-popping numbers um as as a running back down there and you watch his highlight reels and it just looks like he's playing not only running at a different speed but just playing a different game than a lot of the uh, than a lot of the guys trying to get him so a um, couple things to keep in mind. Auburn was heavily involved. Auburn probably finished uh, second in this one. Miami was involved as well. Uh, from everything we're hearing from the recruiting gurus, this one's probably not over as well as as far as him definitely signing at Penn State. He's still planning on taking his official visits, so that will be including Aub- and assume assuming Auburn is still recruiting him. Auburn will be included, so I wouldn't count them and, um, you know, famous good guy Q Freeze out, but, <laughs> I mean, I would rather have him commit to Penn State and have Auburn try to catch us than him commit to Auburn and we have to try to get him. So, overall, really good news. He's a top 100 player, uh, according to one of the publications. I forget which one, which one it even is. Um, so that's how we consider him too. He has a top 100 player and always yeah. take the highest that if you're new to us, we always take the highest. That's right. So we always, so we view him as a top 100 player too. So Corey, tell us about Elba, Alabama. Corey is our resident Alabama expert for those who Correct. Are new. I, he lived in Alabama. For would that make me like a correspondent? Yeah, am I, sure. Am I technically a correspondent? Sure. We'll roll with that. Yeah, I mean, look, I I don't I don't know very much about Elba, Alabama specifically. Uh let's be very clear. Uh again, somebody who lived in Alabama for four years, Elba's not a very big town. I did did talk to my sources in the Alabama area. Glowing, glowing uh feedback as far as how good a train is they did preface everything by saying you know he's 1a so you gotta have to kind of keep that in the back of your mind a talent level he's going against isn't the best even in alabama it's not it's not the best uh you can kind of see that when you see his film i think his yards per carry is like 15.7 so a lot of times he's not getting touched for for quite quite a bit of time that being said to, to steal one away from Auburn, Auburn really wants Alvin Henderson. There's no doubt about it. But for, but for him to commit and basically say like he didn't want to stay in Alabama and he wants to be part of like the great running back tradition at Penn State, I think is a, a different selling point that might stick in the dog days of August September when commits tend to like to flip. Um, that's not saying it's a lock, but. It's better than previous Alabama commits that were maybe harder to hold on to. Um, I just can't get over, you know, th- this guy is not very far away from Auburn, relatively. And without any family connections, without any um, legacy connections to to go down there and, and to steal, to have even a player consider you is is one thing. From Ryan Snyder on Blue and White Illustrated, basically saying that he wanted to commit earlier, most likely to Auburn. Penn State was able to hold that off and get him to come visit and basically seal the deal. I mean, 
for anyone that's saying James Franklin's lost a step in the recruiting, like this is a huge win from a optics perspective. So um, big get. Curious to see how it all plays out when it's said and done. But regardless, this is an impressive, impressive pool for Penn State. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Like you, um, you think about too J1 Cider and how key he has been. I think he won Recruiter of the Year uh, in the Big Ten last season from Twenty Four Seven Sports, and there's a reason for it. I mean, the guy it. You don't really want to be going up against him as an opposing coach. So as long as J1 Sider sticks around, I think there's a better chance than not that uh, Mr. Henderson will sign on the dotted line with Penn State. So they've got a lot of running backs in this class. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean that's they got the next three now in 2025 yep. now. Um, Tiki Hayes, uh, Barker, and now and and now Henderson. And they have a commit in the 2026 class yeah. running back as well. So, and you have, you're going to lose Katron Allen and Nick Singleton next year, but Cam Wallace, plenty of eligibility left. Quinton Martin, who we're going to talk about probably pretty extensively in a second, is a true freshman. London Montgomery, who we got to see a little bit of wiggle from, also just getting started with his career. So you're going to have a lot of talent there, even after Singleton and and Allen leave, which in the world of the transfer portal, which we'll get to towards the end of the show, you kind of have to. But what about the receivers? Yeah. Well, which we are getting to. Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, Any final thoughts on on that? Um, I did want to mention one other guy just as a little kind of tidbit, something that I had, you know, I'd seen or um, wanted to mention as far as maybe somebody to keep an eye on. Um, And that's Jaden Lofton, defensive lineman from New Jersey. Um, I think he's been up to Penn State a couple times in the last month. And we always kind of throw up the green flag whenever I a, a player or recruit comes and visits multiple times in a short period usually is a good sign for Penn State. So kind of keep keep that one in your back pocket at the water cooler. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're going to see some of the – now, the keep in mind, too, uh, recruiting weekend uh, – blue I should say blue-white weekend is usually a bigger recruiting weekend than it was this year. Not to say there – there weren't any really good prospects on campus there were but it wasn't like previous years so a, a lot of this past weekend was just building uh was a, a lot of the best talent was actually the 2026 guys so right just something to keep in mind as well like there are a lot of targets out there that we're still nailing down official visits and yeah, this will really, as as it does every year now, it'll really heat up come June. Yeah, June's gonna be June's gonna be crazy as it always is. Uh, all right, let's talk blue and white. The game itself. I have a decent amount of notes. Um, do you want to just start with quarterback and go there first? Start with quarterback. Okay. So, and I see. Uh, Mighty Jew on YouTube says Quentin Martin looked really good. So thank you, Mighty Jew. Uh, quarterbacks. Is it safe to say, Sean, that the quarterback situation was immeasurable on Saturday? We, we weren't going to get very much out of it given that it's a practice situation that doesn't necessarily help the running or trying to understand where the, the, the running aspect of the quarterback position is, for example, that doesn't help Bo Perbila at all. Um, Is it safe to say that we weren't going to get out of it a lot out of it from what Bo Perbila can do. And because of how windy it was, we also weren't going to get very much out of it from what Drew Aller can do. At the same time, at the same time, 
I wasn't blown away by either quarterback. And that's not a pun, but I guess it kind of is. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I thought Bo moved well <laughs> for not being able to uh, to touch him. And we talked about this last blue-white game, too, that we kind of told people, yeah, we know Bo did it. You didn't get a whole lot of Bo, but a lot of it is because he brings so much of a mobility, so much more mobility to his game. That's just part of how he plays. And I felt like he was more elusive this year than he was last year, and he showed that off a little bit. As far as throwing the ball goes, and at quarterback, you're most no matter what, the most important part of being quarterback is throwing the ball. Yeah, I mean, neither guy was very uh, it was very accurate. Now, did a lot of that have to do with the win? Of course it did. Yeah, I mean, it was it was gusty. There's a word for you. Like, it was mm. so, so windy. Um, you know, the ball placement, we talked a little bit. Corey actually ha- happened to live tweet this one. Um, you know, Corey had mentioned that the ball placement wasn't very good, which is true. But then you do have to wonder how much of it has had to do with the wind. And I think right. quite a bit of it did. Um, there were, I will say, Drew looked a little less robotic than he did last year like i felt like he went through things a little quicker um went through his progressions a little quicker part of that is we ran a lot of slants like we slant a lot of slant patterns a lot of crossers there's a lot more of that just in the blue white game and you can only take so much out of that but there's a lot more of that than we probably saw in most games last season so Um, I think that just plays like that helps the quarterback be more decisive because kind of has to be more decisive then and put it into, put it into smaller, smaller windows. So overall, I don't think you can take a whole ton out of it, but I wasn't that impressed by anything that I saw from any of the quarterbacks. Didn't, didn't solve all of our questions before this hiatus going into summer. Uh, And by the way, if Drew Aller came out through for 300 yards and missed two passes, I'm still not going to say, oh, okay, we we solved the quarterback spot. I would feel better, though. I'd feel, I'd feel a little better. (laughs) I'd feel a little, I'm not saying, you know, you wouldn't feel any better. Um, Yeah. But I wouldn't feel like everything is fixed. I do think, though, it solidified how I felt about Bo Brabilo throwing the football. Yeah. Be- because he just doesn't have the ability to cut through the wind. And everyone's saying, oh, the wind was so bad. Well, the wind's not going to go away come the fall. I don't know if you've been to Happy Valley in, in September, October, November. But the wind's not going to just go away. And you've got to have some arm strength to cut through some of those gusts. Um, so that, to me, was... That was glaringly obvious yeah. that B- Bo was struggling to throw the football. I know the interception was on a miscommunication, but um, that was a duck regardless. Uh, and the only other thing I wanted to say was with Aller, sometimes he looked more comfortable at the same time. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about this when I get to the film uh, in the next couple of weeks, but Drew Aller was still at times throwing off his back foot and still looking a little bit uncomfortable. The back foot stuff is starting to really worry me. You hope to get that cleaned up as before we head in the fall, but that was something we saw last year. So I'd like to see that get cleaned up a little bit. All in all, like it was fine. But like you said, we're we didn't we didn't learn a whole lot going into the summer. Is it fine as when your fiance is kind of mad at you and she goes, it's fine. Is it that no, kind it, of fine? It, or is it, is it fine? It, it's just like, uh, you know, ever, you know how I would describe it, how I would describe the passing game on Saturday would be like, I don't care where you are in the United States, what town you live in, small or big, there's one restaurant that has a massive menu, huge menu. And when you look at the menu, you're like super duper excited because they got, you know, shrimp tacos, but they also have, you know, wings. You know, they've got a really good burger. 
but they've also got quesadillas. And you're like, I could eat like here every day and be happy. And that gets you really excited. But then what you realize is a restaurant that can do almost everything is almost guaranteed to not be great at anything. And you're okay with it because you go there knowing that everyone's going to find something on the menu and it's going to be fine. It's not going to be the best quesadilla you ever had. It's not going to be the best burger you ever had, but it's going to be fine. You're going to be okay. You're going to enjoy the meal. You're not going to be overly satisfied with it. You're not going to, you know, think about how you're going to get back there so you can have those shrimp tacos again, but it's going to be fine. And you would consider going back there. You probably wouldn't even get the same thing because the why you like the place is all the different options. But the place is fine. <laughs> okay, it's fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, Bo's arm strength or lack thereof did, did show. Um, there was one play that he, I think it was the first or second drive, that he tried to throw the ball away, and it just barely made it to the sideline and i was like that that that's that that's ugly um so that did show and it's not ideal especially since he could be the starter come 2025 uh yeah grunk meyer got in there too we should at least mention grunk, grunk got, got in, in there. yeah he and, uh, and jackson had... smolik's hurt for everyone that was curious yes. and luke rent he it looked like um, Grugmeyer had Luke Reynolds open, but he overshot him um, in one of his drives. That was really the only thing. I, I Grugmeyer didn't do a whole lot that was memorable no. in this no. game. That was the one thing that sticks out to me. Uh, but he did play, um, but not not super impressive. But first game, first spring game, he should be a senior in high school right now. Not going to. Not going to bury him too much for it. Yeah, the early enrollee quarterbacks, you can tell pretty quickly in the blue and white game that they are just, it's really good for them to be there. Yeah, absolutely. But they've got a lot, they've got a lot of work to do. Um, And that was his first time in Beaver Stadium too, playing. That's a good point. Yeah, so, and James Franklin mentioned that in the the uh, post-game press conference that they did not get to Beaver Stadium for any of their spring practices. So that was, that was the first time they'd gotten there, which is, which is odd for them. They usually get in there quite a bit more. Um, Evan Thomas asked about good options for the wide receiver group in the transfer portal. We will get to that just a little bit later on in the show. Uh, Mighty Juice says we need Drew to step up this year when it matters. And and yeah, I think that's that's what Penn State fans are expecting, right? You gotta you gotta do something in the big moments. So we you can get you can get by the Marylands, you can get by the Indianas, although he had a good moment in the Indiana game. Uh, it's gonna be the it's gonna be the Ohio States, the Michigans, the Oregons, the USC's where Jarrell is going to have to step up and make a couple plays. Um, all right, let's let's do it, Sean. Let's talk wide receivers. Uh, I guess we should start by saying Keandre Lambert Smith cleaned out his locker on Monday, reported on Tuesday that he was likely in the transfer portal, but not official. Wasn't at practice on Wednesday. Um, was not, although it was on the roster, was not a uh, participant in the blue and white game and officially entered the transfer portal, I think Sunday, technically, maybe Monday, um, because he's a graduate, so he can go whenever, technically, um, with the portal opening officially yesterday on Tuesday. Keandre Lambert Smith goes in, Malik Mega also goes in, who Forget about wide receivers for a second. It was a real bonus as far as we we thought he was a pretty good um, member from the leadership side of things and also uh, as as a special teamer. Uh, so you're going to miss him there. Both those guys didn't participate. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about them. Well, we can talk about them now, Sean, I guess, uh, before we talk about the other receivers. Uh, your thoughts on Keandre Lambert-Smith entering the portal yeah i mean i i spoke to friend of the show big ted ted go check him out on youtube um about this already and you know i think the surprising thing was he didn't do it earlier and 
he didn't do it right out of right after the bowl game. And we had talked about it on here that it could be something that happens. So then he's with the team all spring. And then, you know, you start hearing whispers that turn into basically roars that he gone. And then he left. So, I mean, it's definitely a, it, it's, it's a loss from a talent perspective. Um, but if you, and why he left in my, like, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, it's NIL and money and not in this case. I think, and I'm speculating a little bit, uh, but reading tea leaves, I think he wanted to be, to be the guy. And I think he felt, again, speculation. I think he felt a little bit slighted that the room is kind of gravitating towards Julian Fleming. And Keandre Lambert Smith is thinking, well, look, I'm a fifth or sixth year guy. And I was the best receiver here last year. And then this guy comes in. And all of a sudden, I'm not the guy anymore. And I think it's a little bit, um, I think he felt a little bit entitled to be the leader. And he's gone now. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's very complicated. Some people are like, you don't know the whole story, man. I, I don't think there's much of a story to know, <laughs> to be honest. I think Keandre is a... One of the words that I heard to describe him is mercurial personality. And that's a good way to put it. And I don't think he's somebody that is it. I think he's didn't have great vibes from the coaching staff. And I think they were a bit at, at odds. And that's why he's gone. So. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, let me just preface this by saying I appreciate what Keandre Lambert Smith did. He he's here for a while. He had some really awesome moments. Some, you know, the the Rose Bowl catch was kind of the cherry on the top for that season for Sean Clifford and and for Keandre Lambert Smith and that whole team. Um a lot of really good hell hell the the Purdue catch and run was a huge play to open that season. So there's a lot of great moments. Uh, KLS, nobody can doubt his talent is reason why he right now he's a number one wide receiver in the transfer portal. Fantastic on the field player. Um, but let me be very clear. This is, this is addition by subtraction. You can argue he provides depth and you always want to surround and get as much talent in your room as possible, but not at the sacrifice of your locker room. And I'm not saying Keandre Lambert Smith was like a clear problem by any stretch of the imagination, but he tweeted things. He decided to um, not speak to media members after the the Peach Bowl and then decided to tweet things after the fact. He insinuated that things weren't necessarily wide receivers' fault, that maybe they are the coordinators or the quarterbacks. That's, that's not what leaders necessarily do. And what I, I struggle with was when KLS was an underclassman, he had a lot of fantastic – wide receivers, not just on the field, but off the field to look up to and to learn from. And I don't really know if that's been reciprocated. Julian Fleming comes in and we've heard right away. Um, Drew Aller spoke about it post post about post game about the. Uh, about the monarch jug machines and whatnot. But it is very clear from winter workouts that Julian Fleming has provided a leadership presence. You can take that as two things. Number one, Julian Fleming is adding to the leadership or there was an absence of leadership in that room beforehand. And Julian Fleming, like you said, is going to get a lot of attention. Pennsylvania boy from right around here. He's going to get that attention, whether or not Keandre Lambert Smith or anyone else 
want to take that away or wants that spotlight to be on them. Fleming's always going to have that, especially since he was really coveted originally, et cetera. I mean, before Fleming even caught a pass out of practice, he was already done a couple commercials for for some local uh, local dealerships. So you tie all that together, the environment that was then created with Julian Fleming coming in was not going to be conducive with Keandre Lambert Smith being there in a in a Robin role to Julian Fleming's Batman. And I, I say all that with Julian Fleming not even being on the starting side in the blue and white game, but that's kind of what it was shaping up to be. And and Keandre Lambert Smith was not going to be a, a addition to the receiving core in that specific role. I don't think Keandre Lambert Smith's a bad player on the field or a bad player off the field. But like you said, he wants to be kind of that guy. I don't think he would have taken it very well to be the uh, the passenger princess to the Julian Fleming show. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. And and yeah, I agree with you as far as Keandre. He 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 was a good player here, and he had some really good moments. He has the longest reception in Rose Bowl history. Um, you know his explosivity was on display multiple times. I didn't think enough last season. And look, the whole month, last month of the year, he, he disappeared. And then, um, you know, the bull, and then, like you said, just things like avoiding talking to the media, like, dude, that's not being a leader, <laughs> not do, right. talking to the media after, you know, and your receiver room, which you are the leader of is under siege from every direction, from the media, from the fans. And then you don't get up and talk and, and you run away from the media and then you go on Twitter. Like that's not a leader. So yeah. I don't know why he felt the need felt like he was entitled to be treated as the leader. I, I, I don't get where that comes from, but you know, like I said, see ya. Yeah. And, and again, I, I think he's going to land at a really good spot. Like I said, a lot of the top Schools are going after him because he's the number one player in the transfer portal. I just answer Evan Thomas's question right now, since I think it ties in really well to this. Who do you think is a good option for the receiver group in the transfer portal? I don't know if there is one yet. I mean, just kind of think about this for a second. If Keandre Lambert Smith's the number one wide receiver in the transfer portal, I mean, I would argue you're not going to go in and get anything, anything less than Keandre Lambert Smith. So unless Keandre Lambert Smith wants to come back, I would say there there isn't anybody from a talent perspective specifically. Now I, I know that there's one uh, former four star um, receiver from Michigan that just entered the portal, but again, uh, I think Bud Elliott had a really good tweet about how you need to read the lingo when players enter the portal, and if they mention current stats from last year, then they're probably really, you know, someone you should really pay attention to. If they try to accumulate all of their stats from when they were at a certain university, then they probably didn't have a really good year. They just probably maybe did a couple things over the course of three or four years. And then if they ever just use preseason All-American or preseason favorite to win an award, it means they probably didn't have a good actual year. So I, I love that tweet. I think I retweeted it. Um, but yeah, it was a. Uh, it's a good way to kind of look at things. And in my opinion, looking around, there might be somebody that Penn State's going after. But again, Evan, if there is somebody obvious, how much do you really think Penn State's going to land that person? Yeah, from from an NIL perspective. Yeah, and look, guys, nobody's really. Run into Penn State to be a receiver, <laughs> and that sounds a little weird because Jahan was just here, but it's it's, it's old just news not at this point. Honestly. Yeah, it, it's old news, and Penn State's just generally not thought of as a receiver school. Like Jahan is our first wide receiver, first round pick since I don't even think Bobby Ingram was. Like it's just mm -hmm. not really a receiver. Uh, Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson was the last one, but. That was 20 years ago. So, I mean, there, there's not 
it's not really known. Like if you're a corner, if you're a safety, if you're a linebacker, if you're an edge, yeah, Penn State's a terrific option for you in the portal. And Penn State has done well at those positions. That's why A.J. Harris, part of the reason A.J. Harris is here. But receiver, and then like you said, from an NIL perspective, receiver, not counting quarterback, you probably need the big, you probably need your biggest NIL package to be able to land a really high quality one out of the portal. Right. And I don't know if Penn State's in a position right now to be able to do that. And like, and like you said too, I think I expected it. Maybe, maybe it'll turn out to be that way. I expected more receivers to be in the portal and people are talking about Keandre Lambert Smith, like he's Jerry effing rice because he is just the best guy in there right now because that there just aren't a whole lot of guys that that are that people could look at and say that guy's going to be a number one receiver or that guy's going to be a number two receiver in a really good receiving role. There just aren't a lot of guys out there right now. So no, there's no. That's Keon a bit Coleman alarming for me. Trees. Yeah, that's a bit alarming. Well, let's talk <laughs> about the current receivers and what away. what your thoughts were. So, like yeah. I mentioned, Julian Fleming was actually on the blue team. A lot of the transfers were on the blue team. So don't read too much into that. Um, it's probably more of like earn your stripes kind of thing there. Um, I think he had one catch. He was technically was targeted on that Bo Previla interception by Zaki Wheatley. I don't know if Fleming ran the wrong route or Bo Previla threw the ball the wrong place, but that one was that one was pretty tough. Um, otherwise, pretty quiet day for Julian Fleming. Um Trey Wallace is who we have to discuss, right? I mean, had a really good day. I think he just reminded everybody that when he's healthy, he's 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 something to pay attention to. Um, I think it was Nate Bauer who had a really good point that they he made somebody miss in space. Like Penn State did not make a lot of people miss in space last year. That was kind of the biggest issue. Like everyone was talking about explosive plays and like just wanting Drew Aller to throw bombs. But a lot of explosive plays nowadays in college football is one guy catching the ball, making one person miss and going 88 out the gate. They didn't do that at all last year. Trey Wallace made somebody miss and and had a couple chunk plays. And that was really nice to see some couple relatively hard catches. I know he technically dropped the one in the end zone. I would argue Either he looked over the wrong shoulder to begin with or Drew Aller threw it to the wrong shoulder, which, whatever, he, he probably should have still been caught, but I don't think people understand how difficult that is of a catch. Um, all in all, I thought Trey Wallace played fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, Trey showed what he had, um, and he looked quicker to me. Like, last season, I really didn't see him make a whole lot of guys miss. He was just always... He's basically a big possession receiver um, with with some speed. He's got some, you know, vertical speed for sure, but you didn't really see a whole lot of shiftiness out of him. And you did in the in out blue-white game, of course, he's going up against, you know, well, actually, the, the corner, it was a lot of good on good, actually, because the corners, uh, A.J. Harris and um, Kimber, I always forget his first name. Jalen. Jalen Kimber. Uh, they were both on the blue team. So you actually did see him go up against some high quality guys. Um, and he made a couple guys and he made, um, you know, he made a couple guys look silly out there. So that was nice to see. Um, yeah, Fleming didn't do a whole lot. He had the catch. Um, Caden Saunders uh, showed some explosion. He had a chunk play. Also had a drop. Um, I think he had two catches. He was targeted five or six times. So it's not, you know. I, I, I'm not starting the Caden Saunders for Heisman campaign or anything, but he showed he showed some things that he could do that he could do well. And when he came out of high school, he was noted for his explosiveness. And I don't think we we've seen a whole ton of that at his during his time at Penn State. Um, Clifford the Younger also moved the chains. Kind of, I'm very interested to see you know with what Kotal Nicky does with him. Because he seems like the type of guy that if a creative offensive coordinator gets his hands on him, could make some big catches for us this season at some big spots. Uh, because he he's going to be able to utilize what Liam Clifford does well. And he's a good route runner. He could 
get open. Now, does he have blazing speed? No, but he could get open. He's a, he's a good route runner, and he, I think Kotal Nicky could use him in some creative ways from that slot. So with KLS little, going, that slot position McConkey. open. Exactly, Labakaki or Wes Welker or Julian Edelman, take your pick. Um, yeah, with KLS gone, that uh, competition for slot really opens up. And all, all the jokes aside of Lad McConkey compared to McConkey might be a first round pick. He's more of a Hunter Renfro type, in my opinion. If we're going to be precise about it. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter Renfro. Um, Amari Evans, Amari Evans, Tyler Johnson didn't really see much there. I thought we might see a little bit more in, in that regard. Uh, Amari Evans had a really good, you know, blue and white game last year. So. Was hoping it's sealed, but but again, I mean, it was windy and it was hard to kind of. Um, oh, I wanted to mention this. Caden Saunders said after the game that they showed maybe five percent of their offense. So very bland, very dry. Just kind of keep that in the back of my. I will yeah. say this: they threw the ball a lot more than I was expecting them to. It wasn't, again, a pretty performance, but I mean, they got some work in. They did. They did. Um, I was, and we talked about this a little bit privately i was thinking they might pack it in a little bit for the blue white game i'm happy they didn't when when they saw how windy it was going to be i'm happy they didn't because i mean you're gonna see some windy conditions playing in the big 10 um you know especially uh playing at a place like now we don't play at indiana this year but like playing at a place like indiana i swear it's always windy like that too when we go when we go out there you get so, the west man it gets it gets windy yeah or you go to northwestern or you go to illinois like that that's just how it is there so you gotta you gotta be ready for that um i was hoping to see carmelo now, taylor yeah we, we didn't, didn't see a whole i i don't no. remember seeing much of him at all like no. And just things, and I totally buy, like, we really saw 5% because it was very vanilla. Um, like, you didn't see any motion, even. No. <laughs> I, didn't think, see any. I think somebody said they motioned once. Yeah, I that. didn't even notice. Like, it was just kind of, all right, line up, we're going to run this play. And that was it. Which, by the way, is how it should be for the blue-white game. You shouldn't be showing a whole lot. So, and any Kotal Nicky did not. So, we're going to see a different looking offense come uh come august so i don't want to go down the rabbit hole with this but sean there's in there two two camps to that right where excuse me number one don't show anything so nobody can you know prepare for you or number two show everything and then say how do you prepare for all of this and i understand that i kept like we talked about this last year a bunch like Mike Yurcich has more up their sleeve. Everyone, it was like November, and people were still telling us, Yurcich still's got something up his sleeve, baby. I'm like, okay, like, it's no. show it against this is or eight Sparty. Right. Like, <laughs> this is what we are, okay? And if we and if he has a lot more up his sleeve, then, then he should have taken that shirt off, like, a month ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think they're I think though the reason you don't show a lot in the blue white game is West Virginia has four months to prepare for us. So they will be able to go and look at everything we do and be like, all right, bet. <laughs> As the kids say. Right. We're gonna bet. Yeah. Like, okay. Like the Michigan <laughs> we'll go and look at, and we have four months to prepare for you fools. I'm so, pretty sure Michigan killed the whole bet thing that uh, day. Oh, they did. They have to ruin everything, don't I they? I think they literally ruined it. Like, I don't hear, I mean, I'm not around high schoolers or college kids very much nowadays, but I don't think they say bet nearly as much anymore. They were the most cringe national champions there there have ever been. Yeah. Um, In every No way. bias there. No bias there. And then, uh, no, not at all. We, yeah, we, we mentioned Saunders and Evans, answer Evans' question there, and I guess we'll wrap up this conversation with like if Penn State goes in there, I know a couple of weeks ago. Well, no, you know what? We're gonna say that because we have a fan question about um, about that. So let's move on. Um, I want to talk offensive line, Sean. In fact, we're gonna hold off on the running back conversation because we have a fan question on that too. Um, offensive line. 
Anthony Dunka did not play. Wanted to men- mention that, so we didn't get to see him. Drew Shelton was obviously out. Javen Williams got a lot of snaps and uh, because of all of those injuries and whatnot. Um, and Nolan Rucci got got a lot of snaps as well. Uh, Nick Dawkins, I think, primarily played center the whole game. Uh, Cooper Cousins got in at right guard because Sal Warmly really didn't need any more practice. He's been there for quite quite some time. Sean, I'm I'm gonna be honest with everybody here. Uh, I know it's April seventeenth, but I I have I'm gonna wave the orange flag here on on offensive line to the extent of you are not going to have the same luxury you had last year with the two offensive tackles that you had and the pass protection that you had. Like, I'm not trying to take a knock on any of the offensive linemen they have, but they are not going to be able to provide the same pocket for Drew Aller that they did last year. And I think everybody would agree with that. So Drew Aller, who we were just talking a little bit about throwing off his back foot a little bit too much, is going to have to throw the ball in more unorthodox ways than he had to do last year because the pocket is not going to be as clean. Um, he was sacked 15 times last year. I mean, you're probably expecting closer to 2025. 20, I mean, that's just that's just you're losing a top five pick and an offensive tackle. But I am I'm concerned about where they're going to get to to start the season. I mean, I think Andy Kotelnik is going to have to run a lot of play action. He's going to have to move the pocket a lot. And, and find ways to really get his offensive tackles comfortable, especially in September when they're still trying to figure it all out. You get, even Drew Shelton, who's now kind of like the cornerstone in the tackle room, is still fairly young. So, Sean, I, I, I'm nervous about the offensive line. I think they've done some good things to make me feel encouraged, but they're still like – you're still dropping off from a talent perspective because you and I are huge fans of Caden Wallace too. Like there's going to be some growing pains here. Yeah. We talked last, last season during the year, like saying, Hey, you have a really good offensive line right now is I feel like people didn't fully appreciate how good the offensive line was. Right. Uh, were they perfect? No, especially in run blocking. There were things that they could have improved, but pass blocking. Yeah, they were really good. <laughs> and a lot of that. Yeah, it starts with the tackles. Your tackles are some of your most important two of your most important positions on the field. And you had two guys that are going to be uh, Olu's going to be taken in the first round and Caden Wallace is going to be drafted. So you had two draft eligible offensive tackles and there are there aren't a whole lot of teams like that. And it showed a lot in in pass protection and how well they held up. And I felt like last season, a lot of people would be like, oh, they allowed a hurry. These guys suck. And no, that that, that it, it's hard to block out really good edge players all the time. But, you know, now you have a lot of green at offensive tackle and just a lot of unproven guys. Now, we all know Drew Shelton. He's played a lot. Uh, didn't play in the spring. He's been banged up all spring. Uh, Donka, uh, I thought, played pretty good against Ole Miss, uh, but didn't play yeah. on Saturday. And then, yeah, I think I thought Javen Williams, he was OK. Um, I'm not going to say he was really good. I thought Jamil Lyons beat him a few times. And it shows you how deep the edge guys are that um, he that that Jameel Lyons is on the blue team and with most of the backups and he's still, he beat Javen if you know, a few times. I thought Nolan Rucci had, I thought Nolan Rucci looked pretty good. I thought he looked bigger than I thought he would be uh, in per When I got to see him in person, I thought he, I thought he, it looks like he put on some more weight, which is good because he needed to. Um, the guard play, I thought Cooper Cousins looked like he belonged, and that's what I was really looking for with Cooper Cousins. Um, I know all the hype is – like, if there's if there's a guy to buy stock into right now on the Penn State stock market – I think you're too Cooper, late. I think it's it, already bought. Yeah, you, you, like, you, were, you missed it. Like, yeah, kind of get on the train now because this guy, he's going to be really, really good. He, he pancaked a couple people. I mean, he's he looks to be the real deal. 
Uh, Dawkins looked steady. Um, and then Vanga, I didn't really notice a whole, you know, I, I thought he, I thought he was solid. So I thought the interior looked good, but the tackles looked leaky. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about the backups, poor Egan Boyer, man, <laughs> having that assignment with, with the dual Carter, I, I felt cool. bad for him at times, but he's a, he's what a true freshman offensive lineman should look like. Right. And Cooper Cousins is the, uh, the ex- the uh, exception of exceptions to the rules. So um, I'm not ready to to pull Egan Boyer scholarship or anything because he couldn't block up Dual Carter. He's gonna he's gonna be fine. Um, but yeah, I mean he he looked like he looked like a freshman. Um, Berkmeyer played on the blue team. Wasn't too thrilled by how he played either. I thought he had some. He was so-so at best, but he's a young guy too. So you got to wait for these guys to develop. Yeah. I think Burke Myers one where people are like, well, okay, when's he going to do something? But again, like normal offensive line growth, Burke Myers still young. And that's yeah, a freshman. Yeah. And uh, people tend to freak out. I want to talk tight ends real quick, Sean. Uh, Ty Warren didn't play. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, I don't think Khalil Dinkins played, did he? He played. He did. Okay. I think he, he only did. had one catch, though. Okay. I didn't see much of him. He didn't play that much, though. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, we didn't hear a lot about Andrew Rappelier in spring practices. And then all of a sudden, Andrew Rappelier was out there a ton. So makes me feel better that Rappelier is, is definitely in the mix there. Um, Schlaffer was in the mix there. Sean, did you see Jerry Cross out there? I think Jerry Cross is hurt. Okay, Jerry Cross is hurt. That's good to know. Yeah, he was on the side, he was right? on the sidelines. So okay, um, and then your boy Luke Reynolds was out there as well, and and looked to fit the fit the part. So I mean, I don't know if we got any clarity as far as where that position group is. I I don't think they're like going to be as good as last year, right? Like Theo Johnson was at the Happy Valley United, and you're like, wow, like yeah, Theo Johnson's huge. I think somebody had a good comment about when Theo Johnson and Adam Brenneman were standing next to each other, and Theo Johnson was like towering over Adam Brenneman. Like you realize how big Theo Johnson is. Um, you're just not going to have that, I think, immediate production that you had last year with those two guys. I think by the like November, you're gonna feel pretty good about where the tight ends are. But there's there's got to be some pecking order that's got to be figured out there as far as you know who's good at what, and that's gonna take a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, I think especially, I mean, Tyler Warren's gonna start. Spoiler alert, um, and he's fine. It was just uh, it was just rest. And Khalil Dinkins, and then the, the the real question is that backup tight end spot. Uh, Khalil Dinkins is obviously the incumbent. I expect him to be the backup tight end um, at this point. But you're gonna, but you, you're gonna have a ton of competition at tight end three because I thought Rapley, Rapley really impressed me. I thought he played. I thought he had a. I thought he had a really nice day. Uh, Luke Reynolds. Um, I, I Rapley is huge. Yeah, he is like he's and, and do you want to know something that irks me? Mm. OK. Of course, Sean, always. I, I don't want to hear anybody describe a tight end who happens to be white as baby Gronk, who wears number 87. Would that come again. up again? No, but it will. And it's annoying <laughs> every time it does. They're not all baby Gronk. Including that that kid that's like ten years old that has the father who calls oh, yeah. him Baby Grock. He's not. We him. don't want to go down that rabbit hole with you, Sean. Yeah. We know you got frustrated with that one. Oh my god! Like every every white tight end with number eighty seven is Baby Gronk if he makes if 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 he farts the right way. And it's like, no, Gronk is the best tight end ever. Stop! Like like they'll name random guys as Baby Gronk. They had the guy from Notre Dame a couple of years ago. They were called Friar Muth that. It's just like, stop. I'm going to cut you off on the baby Gronk talk. I, I'm just getting started. Uh, if, if, I know. That's why I'm trying to stop it before if it Bre- starts. If Brenneman <laughs> wore 87, he would have been great baby Gronk. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And thank God he wasn't. Thank God he was 81. Rant over. Um, yeah, it's going to be a very, it's going to be an intriguing battle, uh, probably especially for that third tight end spot, because like I said, I think Dinkins is going to be hard to unseat. I, I think so, too. I think I think so, too. And that third spot's going to be a mess. You're right. Let's talk defense, Sean. They're I'll good. let you pick. Where would you like to start? Well, we let's go to secondary first. Okay. AJ Harris is your starting corner. He's him. I mean, do we have any? I mean, it just it's it's very clear. Yeah. He was who we thought he was. <laughs> I mean, he came up on that one play, had a really good play um on like a screen or something. I want I want to say it was to I don't even know who it was to, honestly, but he blew it up. And then it wasn't necessarily great passes on the end zone fades, but he defended those well as well. He has the the moxie and that kind of charisma you need to be a QB1 as well. I think he's your QB1. And I, I don't think it's even that. The Riz, thank you. Thanks for keeping me hip. Um I think QB2 is definitely more interesting because you have Cam Miller, you have Zion Tracy, and you have Jalen Kimber. I think all those guys, it's going to be a battle for quite some time. But, Sean, I also wanted to mention Antoine Belgrave shorter because I thought he had met some, a couple nice plays. And I also wanted to mention whoever the heck Colin Dinkins is because he had to pick six, and he also had a couple nice plays defending Caden Saunders and a couple other guys early in the game so dinkins flashed a lot as well uh number 31 so i i just kind of shotgun blasted a bunch of guys but um from the cornerback room specifically um i think king mac is a little bit more athletic than dinkins but dinkins did some good things wheelie had the interception of course uh we mentioned a couple weeks ago kevin winston jr is in a cast so he he for his hand so he didn't play um what do you have, Sean? Yeah, AJ Harris is him. Uh, he, he like every catch that a receiver's made, and you know, people, the cynical people in the audience will say, "Oh, she was good in good separation again," which was kind of true. Um, but a lot of that was the corners played well. Like they're even though corner is a spot that you're going to have to. I don't want to say rebuild that, but you're certainly going to have to reload because you're replacing three guys that were drafted that are going to be drafted. Um, yeah, they they look fine. Uh, AJ Harris might be an all Big Ten player this year. Um, I think you know, I would put money on that. Yeah, Jalen Kimber is gonna is gonna fill in fine. Um, I'm happy you mentioned Belgrave shorter. Uh, for a true freshman who should be playing, who should be in high school right now, yeah, like impressive stuff, young man. <laughs> and then we still have Zion Tracy, Cam Miller, so yeah, they're they're gonna be fine. Um, I got some good and names. We do, we do. Now it's a matter of just putting it all together and getting them on the field come fall. Right. And, um, That's when you gotta feel good that you have experience at safety. Because, yes, because that's the downside with all these guys. They're all inexperienced. Right. And there are going to be some tough moments. You might see it in the West Virginia game. Um, but in the long run, especially by the, t you know, and, uh, you know, the big thing is when Ohio State comes to town, are they going to be ready? Well, by that time, they will be battle tested. So I think they will be mm. ready for that. I think that was the first time he's battle tested so far this year. So oh, glad we got that one. Oh, come fall. We'll be saying it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's go linebackers. I actually don't have very much to say about the linebackers. It's probably what I'll focus on the most when I go look at the film a lot more because I don't have a bunch to say. Um, God, this sounds so bad, but I did see Tyler Ellison miss a tackle. I do remember that. Sorry, I'm, I get in trouble for that one, but I did see that. Uh, Dom was out there for a couple, a little bit, but not much. 
Um, Rojas had one or two plays that I distinctly remember him being a part of. I don't really remember the mics doing very much, but again, I wasn't zeroing in focus a bunch. Yeah. Tom Allen wasn't kidding about the 425. Like we ran 425 pretty much every play. The Lion is You're also gonna... throwing it a lot too. Uh, uh, true. Yeah. The Lion isn't just going to be like your tip you, the 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 nickel was even last season where Daquan Hardy played a ton. No, he's going to the Lion's going to play almost every play. Um yeah. that's that's if you're going to take something out of the blue white game, I would take that out of it. That the 425 is real. And it's not just going to be something that we mix in more. It, no, we're going to run four two five. Like that. That's just going to be. That's the base. That is truly the base defense. Mm. And that means you're going to see less linebackers. And I and yeah, that could be part of the reason too. Now I know the official word is the reason Abdul Carter moved to edge is because he wanted to, which I'm sure is true, but. I think when you're running a four two five, like you're gonna it would make more sense to have a guy like Abdul at line at, at, at edge so then you could keep a guy like Tony Rojas on the field. Yeah, that's a good point. Um to be determined how I feel about the linebacker position. I think it'll be more on that when I get to really look at the film a lot more. That's the one to me I love look like those are the ones I really have to break down every play when I look at the linebackers to, to really know did the linebacker mess up the linebacker that they're supposed to be. It's hard for me to know in the moment responsibilities for the linebackers sometimes and that they're in the right spot. Um, defensive line, Sean, I want to maybe, I don't necessarily, uh, I don't want to necessarily take, heat for this i don't necessarily want to eat crow on this but before the blue and white game i was suspicious about where abdul carter would be in the depth chart at defensive end because again he's a linebacker making that transition to a position group that had a lot of depth feel like coming out of the blue and white game, it, it seems pretty evident that Abdul Carter is going to be starting at defensive end. I'm not saying he's completely polished. We don't really have an idea of what he looks like against the run. But from a pure pass rushing ability, he has some, dare I say, Chop Robinson-like tendencies. Um, also, if you let him know the snap count, Nobody in the country is going to be able to stop Abdul Carter because he was jumping the snap count a couple times, and that's just game over. It's not even fair at that point. But Abdul Carter impressed me. I think he had at least two sacks and was doing some really good things. He was actually out there quite a bit. In fact, he probably played more in the blue and white game than a couple of the games last year because um, to get a more defensive end. And, and last year, the defense was barely on the field um, for the, some of the starters. I think he had a couple couple games where he only had 15 snaps or something like that. So he, he played more than some of the games in the fall for sure. And he looked good. So I just want to maybe not quite eat crow, but I think I feel a lot better about Abdul Carter contributing and being on the field a lot at the defensive end spot. Again, if if I'm a team, I'm probably challenging him in the run game. I know he looked thicker. But again, that's something that maybe you you challenge a little bit. But I think Abdul Carter is one thing that I can maybe check off the box heading into the summer. Yeah. Um, if you want to take something else out of this game, Abdul Carter is going to be fine. Like he's he's going to be really really good. <laughs> um, which is good to see because he's a he's he's an awesome talent and i he did look bigger especially in person than than he was last year and i thought last year he he looked about as big as chop i think he's bigger than chop right now so that's kind of a good gauge uh franklin went out of his way to praise a mean van over it was like mm. his second comment and i thought that was really interesting um he just said he uh, he talked about how proud he was of Amin and how you know and how well how well he's progressed so 
Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, Mentioned, uh, didn't he mention Jameel Lyons by name too? Yeah. So Jameel Lyons too, um, we we mentioned him earlier to talk about how he was against Javon Williams. Jameel Lyons beat him clearly a few times. So he's he's next. I don't think you're going to see, I think his best football will be 2025, but he's going to play. Uh, this year and he's gonna have it's gonna be hard big, to keep him off the field yeah he's gonna have a bigger role um but i still the, stand the by only my, issue is there are four guys in front of him that are really good too yeah i still stand by him being a first round pick at some point well if he is then he probably leapfrogs fisher or yeah uh, van over or or they'll find you know Franklin and uh, Barnes are creative and, you know, Franklin loves a rotation at defensive line. So you're going to see him. Um, I think ideally Franklin likes to play six edge guys and six defensive tackles. So that's probably where Jameel Lyons is going to fit. You can see three defensive ends get drafted next year. Yeah, absolutely. Because the knives going to go Carter's going to go. I think I mean, Vanover gets drafted. Vanover could. Yeah. Vanover's a big dude, yeah. <laughs> you know, like high motor, getting, high motor. Uh, We're almost getting to the draft point where I can use all my fun adjectives. Yeah, like he he I have never seen him take a playoff ever. Or nobody's ever going to question me and Vanover's effort. Uh, both and he and he's very good against the run. Like he's one of he's probably our he's. First or he's second or first best defensive end against the run. Yeah, I was going to say, keep that in mind when, you know, we face teams that like tend to run the ball or obvious running situations. Do they pull Carter out and put Van over? And those are kind of things that I'd be curious to see if if those substitutions happen. Or do we move Carter back to linebacker here? Yeah, yeah. To get them to keep them both on the field. Um, I mean, defensive end is is clearly just – an insane amount of talent. Their defensive tackle, Sean. I mean, last year everyone was talking about defensive tackle. No one's talking about defensive tackle anymore. Um, we got to get bigger. Yeah, I mean that was a conversation. Then we got to get bigger. Res- worse. How bad everyone's been about receivers was like how how bad everyone was about receivers and defensive tackles last year. And now I guess all those people that are mad about defensive tackle have joined the receiver people, and that's what's made the receiver people even more unbearable. But the Venn um, diagram. I thought you were trying to do a little love shape to me. Um, there you go. <laughs> the, I, I feel, I mean, so we had heard some things, some whisperings that Zane Durant is the truth. Um, yes. And people are struggling to block him a lot in practice. So there's a little another tidbit for you. Um, I really think that Devon Ellis found himself at the second half of last season. I still feel really good there. Um got to maybe figure out exactly how the depth chart rolls out for the twos and threes but i mean we feel pretty good there I, again that's another position i probably need to go back and look because i don't remember all the guys numbers and so i probably need to do a second take with the defensive tackles but i, I feel good there yeah they're fine um a couple of the young guys got in on some plays tyreek blanding Made yeah, Blanding had a play. Too. Yeah. Um, and uh, DeAndre Cook had a couple ta- had a tackle or two as well. So that's mm. good to see. And a lot of the the defensive tackles in general, a lot of old guys in there. Um, Devon Ellis, because I is our. I don't think Akeem Beeman suited up, but he's he's there. So don't worry about that. Um, so there's a lot of older guys in that room. So there's really no need to play them a ton in the blue white game. So it was nice seeing a lot of the younger guys contribute. Uh, Zane Durant didn't play a whole lot either, yeah. but he's all of a sudden Zane Durant's been here three years. So um, it's an older group. And yeah, I, I don't think there's, uh, I mean, like you said, it's kind of a 180 from last year. I think defensive tackle is a big strength now on this team. That's a good way to put it. Special teams, Sean, real quick. Punting, Riley Thompson looked good, not great. Um, returning, I don't know why we couldn't catch the ball yeah, for the a ball. little bit there, but we were just deciding not to catch the ball, and that, that was pissing me off. But I'm sure they'll figure that out. They got to figure out return situations with Daquan Hardy gone. Um, so something to keep an eye on there. Kicking, 
One of the walk-ons kicked a field goal. I don't know if you know Barker. His, Barker. It was that. Maybe his first name. It's not Ryan. Ryan. Is it Ryan? I think it's Ryan Barker. And then Sahadak so kicked one, right? Yeah, Sahadak so kicked one or two. Okay. I don't think he kicked a field goal. I think he, or no, he did kick a field goal. I think Barker kicked all the extra points. Okay. It looks like where's Barker's Chase out. Mitchell? Chase, is that his name? I don't know. I think it's it's two first names. Chase Meyer. Chase Meyer, yeah. Chase Meyer. In Tulsa. Yes. Um. Apparently third. <laughs> okay. You know, apparently he's third in line. So that's something they got to figure out too. Yeah. So kickers once again a question mark. Um, Falcons was a big was a big boost to us to us last season. Yeah. Um, and you just kind of hope that they could figure that out. I, I we love that we got Thompson back for two additional years because of the crazy rules of, of the NCAA right now. Um, but it would have been awesome to have Falcons back for another year. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that. See what see what happens there. Um, all righty. I think we're ready for some fan questions. John, are you ready for some fan questions? I like the fans. All righty. Well, as you can see, Ooh. you like that? There's a reason why it's white. You'll see, obviously, when we start. But okay, new segment brought to you by Uts Potato Chips. Which, by the way, Sean, I didn't know this until we were talking on Saturday. But Uts does other things besides potato chips. They've got other snacks in the snack department, and I'm excited to hopefully snack on those snacks more throughout this uh, throughout this partnership. Um, Uts was helping out Mercury. Uh, all weekend, you probably saw Christian Hackenberg teeing off like a cheese puff or whatever he was doing, uh, playing golf. Um, but very excited to hopefully get some more potatoes, snack, potatoes, chips, and snacks in our hands soon. Um, thank you, Utz, for, for being a sponsor with us and sponsoring our fan questions. So the first fan question today. From Aaron, how many wide receivers will we sign in free agency? Over, under, two and a half. And Aaron, we get your joke, free agency. Ha, ha, ha. Um, Sean, how many receivers does Penn State go after? I'm going to go with the under uh, here. But I think you got to get at least one. I mean... These, like the receivers we have, and we've talked about this ad nauseum. Uh, that uh, logo looks really good, by the way. Um, we've talked about this ad nauseum. There's talent in the receiver role. But what does talent mean exactly? It's just, okay, these guys are athletic. These guys are fast. Some of them are big and fast. But right now they're just guys. They're just jags, uh, just a guy. So what does it mean? And I think James Franklin has to look for somebody who he could trust as a proven commodity like a Julian Fleming in the portal. I think the problem is, as we talked about uh, about an hour ago now, Kendrick Lambert Smith's the best guy in the portal at receiver. So... He's not coming back to Penn State. I'm telling you right now. He is not coming no. back. There's not going to be a reunion. So, <laughs> so knowing that, where does this transfer portal receiver come from? I still think they pick one up. I mean, I would like to get two, but I think realistically you're going to get one. And you have to not only just get a guy. Just You don't want to get a guy just to get a guy either. You need to find the right fit. You need to find somebody who you're familiar with. And then the NIL, the NIL aspect has to work out. So it's tougher than it looks. And right now I would go with one, maybe two. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with one there. Um, tend, to, tend to agree with you on that one. All right, let's go to the next question here. Sean, coming out of the blue and white game from Dorito Bandit, longtime listener of the show, um, which player surprised or impressed you the most in the blue and white game? You're muted, by the way. Bunch of schools. Um, I'll go Quentin Martin. And I know that's There's probably the obvious question on that, but yeah, that's okay. I know that's okay. That's probably the obvious pick. Uh, but yeah, he looked like he belonged. Um, and that RB3 battle is going to be intriguing because I thought Cam Wallace showed some showed some nice burst. So I'll go quit. Martin scored a couple touchdowns um, and just looked like he uh, looks like a guy that I could see getting some serious play t- playing time when we're going up against the USC's, up against the Ohio State's of the world. I'm going to go with Cam Wallace. I thought, you know, we hadn't seen anything from Cam Wallace really yet, and I thought he looked really good too. And, Speed's for uh, real. Yeah, so I, I, I like Cam Wallace as well. Quentin Martin, um, for the blog, he did a really good film room breakdown on him. He's so tall that he looks slow, but he's still very quick. So uh, I thought Cam Wallace impressed a bunch. It was also, since we're talking running backs again, um, London Montgomery, it was nice to see him make a guy miss, given that, you know, he's come back from injuries and whatnot. Um, before we get to this next question, uh, someone asked in YouTube, this is from Kent, are the OCDC on the field or in the box on game day? We don't know for sure. Kodal Nicky was in the box for the blue and white game. So I'm expecting that he'll want to be in the box uh, come the fall. I'm guessing Tom Allen's going to be on a sideline. That's that's, yeah. that's what I'm expecting. I think you're right on both. I think that's how it's going to be in the fall, too. And that's how it was on Saturday. Tom Allen was on the was on the sideline. I was looking for him on the sideline. I couldn't find him, though. But at, when I watched on Big Ten Network, he, he, was, there. he was there. He, he was, was there. on the sideline. So. Uh, this next question from Matty Ice. Again, another longtime listener of the show. You're, you're starting to catch a, a little bit of a pattern here with this. Um, is there going to be a more entertaining and fun camp battle than the one for RB3? I was shocked how good Martin looked despite missing a chunk of sprint camp. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Franklin mentioned that he hasn't really had a chance to assess Quentin Martin because he's been quote unquote bumps and bruises, which I'm pretty sure the bumps and bruises count is at like three or four now already for the year. Um, I would say there are more entertain. Well, depends on what you, what you find entertaining, Matty Ice. Um, some people would find the receiving battle entertaining. Other people would find it terrifying. I think they um, find it painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, theoretically, I would find that more fun. But I, I get your point, right? Like you feel – we started the show with this when we were talking about the new commit from, from A-Train Henderson. They're in a really good spot in the running back, and it's fun to talk about it. Unfortunately, you do have to throw the football. Um, and 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 therefore, I would say there's a couple other intriguing matchups that I find more interesting. But um, Sean, you gonna go with RB three? I mean, we're still trying to figure out cornerback one. I mean, we think it's AJ Harris, but we're still trying to figure that out. But I hear what you mean by entertaining and fun, though, because it's not as crucial as some of these other spots. And I don't think there's a bad option. So like Cam Wallace could definitely be your RB3 and you're fine. Quentin Martin could be your RB3 and you're fine. Hell, London Montgomery might be your RB3 and you'll be fine. Um, So from that aspect, yes, I would agree. But there are some more important battles. Do we know for sure Quentin Martin only plays running back? That's another thing to keep in mind. And we know Koto Nicky likes to get creative, so. Indeed. Indeed and we Max do. At, and, he, and Singleton actually said, Koto Nicky told them, the best players are going to play, regardless of position. So so you're not going to see Sean, or, Sean and I are out there. We're not no. going to be there. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last one here from Will Gamble. Uh, do you guys think our offense looks the same as last year? I know Koto Nicky probably didn't want to put too much on the film, 
Uh, it felt very similar to our offense last year. Was it very similar because it lacked a lot of explosive plays or it, because it looked similar from a person? No, I'm just messing around. Um, okay. Mentioned one already. Caden Saunders mentioned it post game. They only showed about 5% of their offense. Number two, Nick Singleton and Catron Allen didn't play. So, no, it didn't look the same. Um, and number three, from a personnel groupings perspective, they actually went pretty much 11 personnel the entire game. So one tight end, one running back, and three wide receivers. That is not really what they did a lot of last year. They had a lot of 12 personnel with two tight ends on the field. I would expect them to have maybe not the same clip, that they had 12 personnel last year, but I expect them to still use 12 personnel a lot more than what you saw on Saturday. Now, that being all said, without all the motions and the blandness of it, I could totally understand how it looked like last year's offense. Yeah, I was going to say, it looked like last year's offense as far as just being, like, sad at times and, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of lifeless. Um so, yeah, in, in that way, yes. Um, but do I think it's going to look like that come fall? No. Uh, Kotal Nicky likes to use a lot of motion. Like I said, he likes to, you know, get his best guys on the field and have them do what they do well, which I thought was the biggest problem with Mike Yersich last year, was not just letting his guys cook and trying to square into circle, hole, or whatever. Um, mm, whatever you, they you say. You never get that right, ever. No, no, but I'm just going to keep saying it every week. So, um, yeah, I think it'll look... I, I don't think it'll look like what we saw on Saturday. Like I said, the motion alone um, is going to be something you'll see a lot of this year that you just didn't see, frankly, any of on Saturday. What are you talking about? They motioned the guy from, from the slot receiver back to the running back spot. Sorry. Not funny. Um, thank you for all the fan questions. Uh, appreciate the the YouTube chat was actually pretty solid tonight. So thank you again for that. And thank you again to Utz for providing us with goodness. I, I, I told this to the one person. Honey barbecue, still my favorite potato chip from Utz. So I should get some of those. All righty. Well, with that being said, I think we're all but ready. To get out of here, Sean. Well, I think we try to do maybe something next week, social media wise, to fill the gap. Um, because we're not gonna have an episode next week, but we'll figure that out. Um, but before you go, was that before you go? Yeah. Uh oh. This will be good. Are, are you paying too much? For health insurance. Too busy. Sean. What? You don't have to do that ad read anymore. Oh. Well, you you want to do your, it? Well, you should look at your cell phone. Oh. <laughs> because I texted you about this. You want to do it? I think you should just do it now. Just I'm just going to do it because I already started it. Anyway, okay. because still a friend of the show. I don't know if we're getting anything from him anymore, but who cares? Too busy to read long, complicated policies. Meet Patrick Maudie of Maudie Health, a former Penn State letterman and your new health insurance coach. Patrick leverages years of expertise to offer customized insurance solutions to help you develop a coverage game plan that secures your family's health and future. As a father, Patrick understands the, the importance of reliable health coverage for your family. From individual plans to family coverage, Patrick ensures you get the best protection for your health and budget. Body Health, one broker, endless solutions. Now offering. I don't think I, we are, though. Well, I don't know if we are, but we <laughs> were offering a $500 cash bonus for every customer referral. So quit overpaying for health insurance. Visit modihealth.com to schedule a free consultation with Patrick today. I think you can still schedule a free one. Anyway, thanks, Body Health. Yeah, I think people are starting to realize why I was doing the ad reads. Well, uh, I never had to do it before. 
I know. I'm sorry. I didn't look at my phone. I, that's on me. I should have mentioned that because I, I, I reached out to our boss um, to see if that was still going. And that, that was not. But I forgot to tell you. So my bad. It's okay, um, man. For people that stuck around for that, thank you yes, so much. Yes, I, I hope I hope everybody did. You know, you know, <laughs> Mister Mister is definitely going to say something when he watches or listens to the uh, episode. I, I hope everybody listened to that because that was um, that was great. But yeah, let's let's definitely maybe try to do something next week, social media wise, a Twitter space. I don't really know something like that, um, and we'll go from there. Thank you for those that were on YouTube. Um, Evan Thomas had one last question about like, wouldn't they see an opportunity as far as transferring in? Maybe, but again, you you don't really know because how confident are you as far as what has Drew Aller proven that you're, you're going to have a, an opportunity to catch the ball. I I feel like that's still up in the air a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one of the unfair things is, not really unfair, but just reality. People only watch, like the general public only watches like two Two or three Penn State games a year. Right. And the ones that they saw, Drew Rogers did not play well in. Now, did he have all bad games? No, he threw for like 26 touchdowns, two interceptions. Like that's, that's good. That's a good split. But it's just those big games that they saw him. Right. Were tended to be his worst games. So that's kind of an issue that he's running into there. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys so much for listening and hanging out with us again. Shout out to Jude and, uh, or see me, Jude, Judd and, uh, and Tyler for, for the love in person last weekend. And, uh, I thought I had one other thing I wanted to say, make sure you're subscribed wherever you're listening. As always, we'll be back in, uh, in two weeks. So thank you guys so much. See you around. Have a good night.